Hi, my name is Shabnam and I'm a member of the robotics group A of the University of Calgary. And today we're going to talk about the virtual drilling app that we've been developing in the past eight months under the supervision of Professor Roman Schor. And next slide, please. And here is the agenda. And next slide. For starters, I'd like to start uh, with uh, torque and drag, the two terms that most of you are familiar with. Drag as the change in the string rate and the torque required for, uh, for turning the drill string. Both of these parameters are very small in vertical wheels. However, they can be significant in a directional wheel and even critical in a horizontal one. Calculating the drilling torque and drag uh, are one of the uh, features that are programmed uh, in our app. And it starts by dividing the drill string into small elements from bottom to top. Next slide, please. The total drag is a summation of drag um, that is a summation of drag on each of these sections. And here, Fn uh, means the uh, normal force uh, that is uh, uh, calculated using this equation. Therefore, so for calculating Fn, we had to find the uh, total, uh, we had to find the tension force as well. Next slide, please. Uh, the tension force uh, was assumed at the uh, bottom of each of these elements. And also it was assumed as zero when the drill string is off bottom. Tension at the top of each element uh, was calculated using Ft uh, plus delta Ft uh, using this equation. Uh, next slide, please. The next step is torque. Uh, torque uh, was also considered at the bottom of each of these sections. Uh, M is zero when the uh, string is off bottom and torque at the top of the elements, uh, M plus delta M uh, is also equal to the torque at the top of the next one and so on. Uh, vertic in vertical hole sections where inclination angle is zero uh, and so is the normal force, our delta M or the torque uh, resistance exerted by the element uh, is equal to zero. Uh, which means the drill pipe can turn with no or very little torque. And now I'd like uh, to ask Benedita to continue with the presentation. Hi, I'm Benedict Tawani. Um, I'm also a member of the robotics team A at the University of Calgary, and I'm going to be talking about the implementation of the work rate and the build rate in our app. Next slide, please. So we have a well plan based on several targets. I will try to tweak the well plan for a formation-based plan in which, which we used on our um, finance elements um, method. So this is the data we're giving, and I'm just gonna give like an example of how we calculated the work rates because it affects the azimuths. Next slide, please. So for the work rate calculation, we use um, the TVD of the bottom, and like we, we subtract the TVD at the top from the TVD at the bottom and then divide by 30 and then multiply by the work rate that is the work rate. So for example, between the TVD of 1,000 and 1,500 um, meters, the work rate is zero, minus 0 0.3 per 30 meters. So for the 500 meters, which is the distance between 1,005 and 1,000, the work rate in that region is given as minus five. Now, in order to calculate the azimuth, we need to um, know the number of data points that we have between 1,000 and 1,500 meters. Next slide, please. So um, this is from our app and it shows like the different parameters um, based on the different um, TVD. So for example, at a TVD of 1,000, we have it at section 201 and at a TVD of 1,500, um, next slide, please. We have it at a section 301. So that means the number of data points between both TVDs is 100. So in order to calculate, use this equation of the work rate divided by the number of data points, which is minus 0 0.05 for the given region. And this was used for um, other regions as well to calculate the work rate, sorry, the azimuth. Next slide, please. So the next one is the build up rate calculation. The build up rate calculation is given as um, the following equation that we can see here. So based on the number of individual observations that we have, depending on the TVD region that we're considering. So the build up rate 
for a particular observation um, is given as the inclination, the inclination difference between um, the previous um, depths and the next depth divided by the difference in the measured depth of both of them. And also the um, build-up rate scale factor is given as the build-up rate scale factor as we saw in the previous table divided by the number of data points based on the TVD region that we're considering. And also the same was also done for the build-up rate noise factor and um, also for the build-up rate noise magnitude for um, the different or the difference in um, TVD. And then um, we also calculated the build-up rate noise magnitude by dividing it by dividing the build-up rate noise magnitude DV, TVD by the number of data points. And then the next step was to calculate the next um, inclination, which is given as the final build-up rate plus the previous inclination value. So it kind of runs um, as a loop until it gets to the last um, TVD. So I'll be passing it on to. Ajesh will be talking about um, the bits interaction. Hello everyone, my name is Ajesh Trivedi and today I will be talking about bit rock interactions and uh, somewhat about uh, vibrations associated with uh, drill string. Next slide please. So as we all know that uh, bit rock in interactions are like a uh, little bit vibrations are a function of bit rock interactions, mainly formation characteristics so this is due to the fact that in most of the cases, the excitation source for drill string vibration is at the bit, um, uh, interaction between the bit and the rock. And we know that uh, uh, ideally there are three types of uh, vibration that we encounter in any normal drilling operation, namely lateral, torsional and axial vibrations. So in lateral vibration, we know that drill string moves side to side along its axis of rotation and uh, uh, for axial vibration, you know, the, the drill string rotates, vibrates along its axis of rotation. The another type of uh, vibration is torsional vibration, which is also responsible for stick slip, uh, which is the severe form of torsional vibration, and in, in which the drill string rotates irregularly when a constant RPM is supplied. Next slide, please. So, how can we explore the drill string uh, uh, vibrations uh, to our advantage? Like. Recently, researchers have tried to use axial vibrations and uh, in the form of vibration-assisted drilling, because the axial vibration they uh, oscillate along its axis of rotation and they in kind of uh, impose a periodic loading at the surface of the rock through the bit. So, what it happens in the vibration-assisted drilling through axial vibrations is that when we apply periodic axial loadings the micro, micro cracks uh, develop at the uh, rock cutter interface. So this leads to a decrease in the rock strength. And upon each periodic uh, loading of the uh, drill bit, this micro gets propagate deeper and deeper with every cyclic loading, which then ultimately leads to rock failure. And as a result, uh, we get uh, like, um, we can drill through the unit volume of the rock through axial vibrations. And so in doing so, what we have observed is uh, that uh, the force requirements, namely weight on bit and torque on bit, uh, we did some experiments, uh, laboratory scale axial loading and uh, the weight on bit and torque on bit was uh, requirement were reduced when we imposed axial vibrations and we uh, uh, re finally it resulted into the improvement in uh, uh, ROP and drilling efficiency. Next slide please. So, so as I said, that at depth scale, how it can be imposed, we can impose a axial loading in the form of sinusoidal wave by fixing our parameters, namely frequency, amplitude, RPM, and uh, ROP, and the total time for which we want to impose the periodic lo loading. And the uh, output, our, our output sensors can measure the weight on bit and torque uh, required to drill through a unit volume of the rock. Next slide, please. So yeah, so how it can relate to our uh, app and uh, uh, deciding the bit aggressiveness uh, and uh, for our bit drug interactions. So as you can see, these uh, two graphs are taken from the uh, IADC uh, website and uh, pamphlet. Uh, and what they show is um, namely a bit, bit aggressiveness is basically the that determines the indentation depth and output torque uh, for any given weight on bit, as, as seen over here from figure two, 
uh, more aggressive the bit is higher will be the rop for, uh, rop because for any given weight on bit there will be greater greater depths of cuts per revolution and for higher rock strength what we uh, what is observed is a higher uh, weight on bit will be required for higher rock strength to achieve the given depths of cut so from this we can infer that um, uh, for a harder rock or for uh, higher rock strength rock we can we can use the higher uh, aggressive bit in order to achieve a given rop and that's what we've done the next slide please so uh, over here as i mentioned that we can impose the depth of cut or axial loading in the uh, in the lab at the laboratory scale while drilling uh, while performing rotary drilling experiments so these are the imp uh, impose uh, depths of cut for at different frequencies from 0.1 hertz from 0.2 hertz 0.3 hertz up to 0.5 hertz and uh, as you can see there are cert after certain delay we impose sinusoidal wave which gets reflected in the our depths of cut we can do this uh, uh, to improve in a, with the combination of uh, bit aggressiveness and uh, whenever bit gets worn out start it starts to get worn out then we can uh, switch to low frequency axial oscillations so that our weight on bit and uh, torque on bit requirements will be less and our drilling efficiency will be maintained now I'll pass to darlington hi so i will be talking about a finite element method which is a way of um, developing our drill ahead um, model because of time i will just rush through this so basically we divide the the whole drill string into elements the important um, forces to take note of is that a negative uh, force in the x direction is the hook load and the um, rotational displacement in the x direction is the surface rpm and in our model, we, we're going to consider the mod model here and have a, another talk going on here as the talk of the model. We have a talk at the surface here and whatever the resulting force down in the X direction is the beat force as the weight on beat and the resulting torque in the X direction is the torque on beat. And so there are um, six degrees of freedom per node. So one element has two nodes three um one three um displacements and and three rotations three translations and three rotations on both sides and the y direction is nothing x is tvd z is um eastern and so these are the forces acting on both the vertical and the um and the uh, directional drill string <clears throat> And for us to be able to calculate this, uh, force, this displacements, we need to convert the, the bit uh, coordinates to global coordinate system and do some labeling. And this is what we found out as our inputs. We have inclination and azimuth for at both nodes for one element changing the length, which is changing measured depth, the uh, young mode loss, shear mode loss, ODs and IDs, hook loads, surface stock, void weights, Talk motor, motor of the talk, talk of the motor, bit um, diameter, and CCS. These are the inputs into the finite elements. And with our coding, we can calculate surface RPM, downhole RPM, and then the added TVD, nothing, and easting. And then downhole weight on bits, left side force, right side force, surface talk, downhole talk, motor RPM, and motor talk. So all of that now helps us to drill and drill ahead and get all our data that is required so tomorrow we're going to be um, participating in the robotics competition and this is the app that we're going to be using which we have developed uh just run an example so the way it works excuse me we took a lot of time to make sure that we are able to um create a well plan that is um correct the biggest challenge we had was the uh was the, the cost length uh, which we found out a way of calculating it so this is the actual well plan and then based on what benedita was explaining this well plan will be tweaked into the formation well plan based on the work rate and build up rate given to us and an, a talk and drag model will also be presented where you have um, the different friction factors and and uh, what the torque and drag is and hook load versus measured depth and if we wanted to take the input from the robotics um, information, we load the data. And when we load that data, it pops up on this screen. 
and then we we run we'll drill to target and drilling to target will drill the well and bring out our end of well report and then we see all the changes that are happening in the control room in terms of the surface we don't beat rpm and then the finite element data in terms of the total stiffness matrix of all the elements per, per time and the global labeling of the members the length of this the length of the rules of the global label of the members would be the number of elements in the string we are also taking the beat as one um, element as well so we look forward to seeing you tomorrow in the competition and we hope to hit the target and every target given to us thank you bye bye What we're going to do after the Q and A is uh, Mike is going to send uh, the coordinates and any information that's required as inputs for the competition, and we'll give the teams a, a, a few minutes to enter that into their models, and then we're going to run one team at a time. And our plan was to start with in, re in reverse order. We we're going to start with Calgary and and then uh, GMIT and then uh, UIS. Okay, the first question was, is uh, in your steering model, are you considering any noise in either, either from the sensor or downhole uncertainty? So what, I've, what we did is, I mean, you, there was a, an Excel spreadsheet given to us by the robotics team that has the, uh, Ball noise, ball noise as you go through that formation tops. So we have the plan path, which has been designed without any noise. So if we give us the targets, we're going to design a plan path and our app is going to create all the uh, inclination and azimuths and measure depth for that plan path. So what we now did was to incorporate the noise into the plan part before we now start drilling ahead because the drilling ahead model will need information from the plan part to see if it's in, if it's in target is hitting the target or not so that's how we are incorporating the noise from the data given to us okay um next question from alex for the model that considers motor as a steering drive, does it calculate how much to slide or rotate to achieve the planned well plan? Yes. Yeah, so the the <laughs> um, the finite element method is how we're using to uh, drill ahead. And so every time we use the finite element method, we compare the distance covered with the uh, that's the, the currently new northern eastern and tvd with the planned northern eastern and tvd so if it is not um equal we try to slide back to we tell we that becomes an input to the finite element method to to use the sliding model so the finite element is divided into the rotate and and um, slide finite element. So we have two functions that we created in MATLAB. One is rotate, one is one is um, um, slide. So if 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 we're in a vertical se segment where we're just rotating, uh, we would we would um, when I say vertical, a straight line, right? It could be tan it could be slant or uh, vertical with zero inclination. We are just rotating. So if at any point the northern and eastern it doesn't correspond to the um, to the planned one. We'll slide back, and then instead of using the rotate um, finite element, we use the slide finite element, which means that the the RPM at the surface uh, will be zero. It will just be depending on the motor RPM. I, I guess a follow up is how do you know does the model or your control algorithm determine when to slide and when to rotate automatically, or do you have to provide that as input? Yeah, so when to slide, in terms of um, sliding in general, anytime we are going through a build, or we are going through, if we're using the uh, AKO, 
the mod model. Anytime we are going through a build, which is when the inclination two is different from inclination one, so we are going through a build at that point, that's sliding. That's when we slide in general. But sliding also occurs every time we are, so when you send data back to the surface, and which is the survey, and then we realize now that there's no, um, we're not corresponding to the plant path, maybe by one degree or three degrees, we need to slide back, right? So that sliding, that detection means the, 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 the <laughs> finer element will, will use the slide model instead of the ro rotate. But if, there, if everything is going according to plan, slide will occur when we're turning or we're building. <laughs> and, that, and that's just um, when we're in a segment where the final inclination is different from the, the expected final inclination is different from the initial inclination or the azimuth is different. So we are either building or uh, turning or building and turning or dropping and turning or just dropping, then we're in slide mode. <clears throat> and that's automatic. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, next question from Robert. Um, I saw again a lot of nice regular sinusoidal inputs. This was tied to the, the stick slip um, data that you presented. Does your model handle transients and other real world anomalous input conditions? So I, um, <laughs> the, the way the model is built, it will, it will handle any uh, any kind of uh, condition because we, we try to the biggest challenge that we've had in this process is getting the plant part to work correctly which is uh, making sure that uh, we understand what it means by turning and building and all of that so so now that we have the whole structure in place any kind of um, an anomaly you want to create, we know exactly where you, where you can impute it. For instance, if you want to create stick slip, we know that is the um, RPM downhole that needs to to fall down to zero and go back up once in a while, and that RPM affects the entire system, right? So that's that's how we can do that. So if whatever the problem is, you will tell us. We will put it before we start running the code. And then we would, uh, you can see it happen um, when the results are coming out. Okay. Um, next question: Why are the direction inputs inputs to your model? Shouldn't that be outputs? Have you implemented any feedback control? So the way the way the finite element method works is this: there is a we've allowed the bit to move in X, Y, Z directions every time we try to drill ahead. We allow the bit to move in three directions, right? And those three directions are the global coordinates. The global coordinates meaning the nothing, TVD, nothing, and Eastern, right? So um, the way we are, we are controlling direction is comparing every, at every time we compare the nothing, Eastern, and TVD with the actual nothing, the plan nothing is in on TVD. And that way we see, we know if we're deviating or not. And if, and then we find the difference between the two sides. So where we should be and where we are, what's the distance? And then we try to accommodate for that by sliding back to, to that particular distance in the finite element slide model. So it's a little bit different now, how we are, uh, taking note of the fact that the point of recording is not at the beat, is some distance above the beat, is that the, the, the data points at that point is what we're using to decide where we are downhole, not the exact points at the beat. So, but the, the idea is the distance between the nothing planned and the nothing actual shows you if we are on, on plan part or we are deviating away. So that the, if the distance is not zero, then there's a there's a there's a deviation away from plant part, and we try to uh, to account for that in the next run of the finite element analysis. What about Darlington? Maybe a follow up. What about on the ROP side? How are you? Do you have a, a feedback loop on 
weight on it and RPM that's tied to the ROP that you're getting? So you mean in terms of increase, if you want to increase it or reduce it, what do you mean? Exactly. So, so it depends on what kind of control we want to fix in. So if you if you want the, 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 the downhole weight on bit is derived from the force in the X direction in the finite element method, right? The force in the X direction. And then that force plus the downhole torque, which is the moment in the X direction of the bit, those two inputs goes into the uh, MSC equation to calculate the ROP based on the bit diameter and all of that. So we we haven't put in something to to make sure we keep increasing or reducing the ROP model, but um, that is if you want the um, ROP to be constant all the time, that is easy to to sort out. <clears throat> Okay. Um, next question. What is the size of the stiffness matrix of your FEM drill string dynamic model that you will be using today? So the stiffness matrix um, for each member, the stiffness matrix is 12 by 12 because you have a, uh, you have three, six uh, degrees of freedom on the J at end and six degrees of freedom on the key at end for each member. But by the time you're looking at the total stiffness matrix, that would depend on the number of elements, right? So, and that's the reason why you see that I put a table, a, a box there to show you the, the total stiffness matrix. Because each member has a 12 by 12 stif stiffness matrix. If you have 200 pipes in there, then the stiffness matrix is, uh, is going to, the total stiffness matrix will be 200 pipes, which is 200 elements, will be 201 joints, and then all of that. You, 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 the, the, the code already would calculate all of that and give you a, a total global uh, stiffness matrix. So it depends on the number of pipes as we're going in and depends on the number of uh, elements. So each pipe or each element, the bit, for instance, is an element, the mod motor, and we went as far as typing all the different types of uh, mod motor into the code so that based on the whole size that, that the, the bit diameter that you give to us, our, our, our app is going to select the parameters for a particular mod motor. Of course, the, the size of the mod motor has to be lower than the, the bit size and then all of that. So you bring the bits, the mod motor, the drill color in terms of vertical well and uh, drill pipe all the way to the top. All of that becomes one element each, and I'm assuming each of them is 10 meters. The, 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 the drill bit is 0 0.11 uh, meters long. So all of that becomes elements, and based on how you're getting into the, the hole, that element would uh, increase and then increase the total fitness matrix, stiffness matrix. But for each element, the, the stiffness matrix is uh, 12 by 12. Okay. Um, the next question, is your model able to reproduce stick slip effects? Have you faced any stick slip in your simulator runs? So to be honest with you, we, we, we haven't even gotten to looking at the result and analyzing the result that we're getting because the coding aspect of it has been complex. We had a very strong challenge in doing the plan part and then the final elements, which which was done by Friday last week. But like I said, we know because we understand the skeletal system of our app, every idea and everything you want to simulate, we know what to do to simulate it. For instance, the downhole ROPM comes from the the rotational displacement at the bit from the finite element method, that's the downhole RPM. That RPM is what people use to simulate stick slip happening, which means that um, if you're seeing your downhole RPM is oscillating in such a way that it's going down to zero at some point and going up uh, to a maximum or high, higher than the expected value, then you know that the, you're having stick slip. So all we need to do is multiply that value by zeros and ones, uh, zeros and a very high number. 
so that you, the no matter what the uh, actual RPM is, it goes down to zero at some point, it goes up again. So that, of course, is a way you can simulate um, stick slip. And that rotational displacement, displacement is an input to calculate the weight on bit in the final element method, right? So if that becomes an input because to calculate the weight on bit, then it's going to obviously affect the, the weight on bit that you get because um, the, um, the end moments, which are the forces and the, and the, and the torque, is equal to uh, the transformation matrix multiplied by the by the displacement plus the fixed end mom moments, right? So the displacements are the R the downhole RPM and the rest of them. That downhole RPM starts going up to a very high value and coming down to zero. That will affect the the weight on bit that you get. So that's how we can simulate it in our in our app. Got it. So Darlington, just a follow up question. So uh, did you are you using the the bit model that we provided? Or you you've developed your own bit model? The bit so, so the bit model is going to take input from the finite element method. We, so to be honest with you, I'm just about to get the actual drilling to, we just got the code <laughs> secured and getting to know how to because it, the, the challenge i had before this meeting is you know you have your inclination from surface to the bottom right and you 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 arranged all the um the tools that you want to use in terms of their od and id and everything from surface to bottom but when it comes to the actual drilling the bottom um, um tools comes first and ma matches with the initial inclinations that you have in your plant path and then it starts going down all all like that right so that was a little bit of a challenge i just solved it right now so the minute i resolve that what happens is that output from the finite element methods goes into your bit model to calculate so we already have a way of calculating torque so we're not going to use that uh torque model because we're using the finite element analysis to calculate it but the the ROP and the rest of them in the in the in the model you provided will use the same thing because the model you're providing is basically the MSC equation tweaked. <clears throat> All right, so you're you're still in the process of incorporating it then, like you did. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Uh, moving on, uh, Fred has the next question. How does your improved ROP? ROP with axial vibe work with PDC bits. So how does what? So Fred, can you clarify, man? Uh, you look like you're oscillating the axial vibrations <clears throat> to get additional force at the bit. I, I, is that with a rock bit and a PDC bit? Do they work equally as well? So, um, I haven't um, sp specifically uh, stated the differences between the PDC bit and the roller cone bit in the app, but where that difference will come in is when you're calculating the area of the uh, of the bits, right? So there's a way that area is calculated based on some um, properties of the bit, and that area comes into play because the way we've done the thing is. There's the, the way we, we show that formation affects the drilling process in terms of the finite element method. There's a force that is going to that's going in opposite direction with the bit. And that force is the CCS multiplied by the area of the bit, right? So that area of the bit is very dependent on the type of bit that you're you're using. Right now, all we're just doing is the diameter that you give us multiplied by uh, pi, 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 pi d square over 4. But in honesty, that area is not really the way it's done. So there, there are some properties of that uh, bit that you use to calculate the surface area, which you now of each of the, I've forgotten the, the, the term. So that's how we can identify the difference between the both the two bits that's one way right of identifying it and then um the the input into the finite element methods are very 
are all rotational displacement and and forces at each of the each of the um, nodes. So depending on what defining characteristics that differentiates between PDC and and roller cone bit, I will know exactly how to reflect that difference in the finite element. But the best place to reflect it is in the finite element analysis because nothing is independent in that uh, finite element. Everything depends on each other. There's a hook load going up. The force at the surface goes negative because it, the positive direction of force is in the downward X direction. So hook load is going up. You have the string weights after the mon motor coming down. You have the CCS multiplied by the area of the bit going up. You have torque at the surface at the um, at the first node. You have torque at the mod motor created by the mod motor at the at the second to the last element because the last element is the bit. The second to the last ele element is the mod motor, and then you have uh, talk of the motor going there. So with all of this, and then the entire string has the possibility of moving up and down in the x direction. Only the bit has the possibility of going x, y, z, because I'm assuming that the drill string is confined to to the whole um, size. So whatever the defining um, differentiation between the the roller cone bit and the PDC bit is we can easily take that and incorporate it somehow in the finite element method. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, next question, Darlington. From the depicted drill string scheme, it appears you have also included some stabilizer effects in your BHA model. Is that is that the case? Yes. Yeah, so you know the way the stabilizer effect is is that the um, the uh, the displacement is zero in those in each of those stabilizers meaning that the the stabilizer is holding the drill string in centralized so no matter how the beat is moving the the those points in the drill string are not going to be moving in any other direction apart from just the x direction right so but what we've done in the final element analysis is that we've just assumed that from the surface all the way to the bit there is no movement in the y and z direction no displacement in those direction the only displacement is in the y is in the x direction so just picture it like this like the way my hand is now so if you put your fingers this way <laughs> i don't know if you can see that so this this is y this is z and down is x tvd nothing eastern so all the displacements that can go in the y and in the z are zero and that's the effect of so in your boundary condition that's the effect of the stabilizer right so we're not saying the stabilizer from the bottom all the way to the top but to make life easier right now we, we assume that the y and the z direction are all zero displacements and the only displacements you have is in the X direction. So that means that the pipe is moving up and down. But when it gets to the beat, because we want to accommodate the fact that it can go in different directions. So when it gets to the beat, we we move, we allow, we give the freedom to go from to to displace into further into Y, into Z, or into X, right? So the effect of stabilizer is that the displacements are zero across the drill string. Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, modeling induced vibration is interesting. Is there a way to detect resonant frequencies to prevent damage to downhole components? Can this be included in your model or is it already included? Resonant frequencies. Yes, that can be uh, easily detected because you know right now um, uh, um, we are calculating the RPM at every node, right? At every node, there's a, so for the rotational drilling, which is, that's rotation and not sliding now, for this rotation, we are assuming that there's displacement all the way down and then there's rotation in the X direction all the way down. So for the sliding from the mod motor, from the top of the mod motor up, there's no rotation, it's just movement up and down, right? 
So if you are doing a rotation and you you are calculating the uh, the the rotational speed all the way down for each node, so that means that um, you can you can see how the drawstring is behaving not just at the surface RPM or the downhole RPM all the way all the RPM all the all the way down. It's not incorporated yet, but it's a very straightforward um, thing to to investigate if there's time. Okay. Um, I think Reid, uh, I think it's a similar question that was asked earlier, but just to confirm Darlington, did you use the ROP and lateral ROP models provided by the competition? I think you said you're still in the process of incorporating it, right? Yes, just the only thing is that you, you put a lateral ROP and my model, our model is going to calculate, is, can calculate the lateral ROP in the Y and in the X direction. So that statement lateral ROP doesn't actually um, state which direction that um, is referring to, because we have an equation that can take the side force in the left and the right for each um, each run of the drawstring to calculate the ROP in both sides as well. Right, so yes, it, it will be incorporated. <clears throat> and next question, Alex from Alex. Seems like a lot of the computations are done with FEM. How does that affect the simulation time? The simulation time. So we calculate the distance. Um, so in terms of the entire uh, it doesn't affect the uh, the speed of the process running, except we put uh, so that in MATLAB there's a way we can make it slower or faster. But if you're talking about the time to drill, how long it's taking to move every step, in terms of comparing it to real world scenario, so you calculate the distances, and um, from there we get a particular cost length. That cost length. Uh, will be will be matched with the ROP to calculate the time it took to move in that cost length. Uh, I think, darling, can it was more to if you're doing all your calculations using finite element method, won't that increase your simulation time? Does it does it take longer to run? No, because it doesn't. It, it doesn't affect the simulation time. So what I was trying to say earlier is there are, so. There are ways we can um, make the simulation time faster or slower, depending on how you want it to be displayed. So it doesn't affect the simulation time per se, but it affects the, the coding time because it's a little bit more complex. Mm, OK. Yes. Um, the next question from Mike, with the assumption of the drill string dynamics, there's no buckling considered in the torque and drag model, correct? There is buckling. So the, the, there's a, uh, so the way we consider buckling is sinusoidal buckling is checked first before helical buckling, right? And then based on some already known um, um, equations, we, so we use that general talk and drag model from bottom to up. And so the, 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 the rule that will be given is not there. Isn't that rule is not in place yet, but the rule that will be given is that when we calculate the tension in all the, um, in all the nodes, this is not finite element. Now this is just talk and drag. So when we calculate the, the tension in all the nodes, if any tension along the drill string is higher than the buckling or a sinusoidal or the other one, then we will not move ahead into the finer element to calculate the drill ahead model. You see, so we will now probably increase the uh, hook load or decrease the hook load to see and run the torque and drag again to see if it releases the if it goes if it doesn't if it reduces these tension forces in all those nodes so that the buckling does not occur then we now move into the finite element and 
run. So the we have a function, and that function is a talk and drag function. We have a finite element function, right? So the talk and drag function gives us the, the go ahead to use the finite element method to drill ahead. That's the vision. <laughs> Got it. Thanks, Darlington.